Thank you everyone for being here tonight. All right, so we're gonna talk about letter as a code system. So, we love letters. I'm assuming you guys are all nerds because you are all here with me on a rainy Tuesday night. <laughs> and if you really think about what we love, it's really funny. It was, I was sitting at a lunch table with my coworker, Charles Nix, and he was describing these people that he had met while he was making birds uh, field guide books and how he was fascinated that these people knew these very specific birds that had this very specific migration pattern. And I was like, ha, ah, that's very fascinating. <laughs> but we aren't really that different. We obsess over all the little details. Like we are that kind of person, uh, you know, those kind of people where we get a menu and we're like, ah, oh, like really, like the spacing over here. We're like, you know, we're like obsessed over like the space between a V and an A and, well, why is this not current? We are those very specific people and we all love letters, but sometimes you have to think about how crazy that is. Like, let's not take for granted that we love these very fascinating group of visual systems. So if we look at the Trajan column, it's from 2,000 years ago, and it looks remarkably modern to our eyes, right? And if you think about what life was like for people 2,000 years ago and how different their life is, it's sort of amazing that we can still read this. And this is a slide where I've just juxtaposed these Sharpie drawings that I did over the Trajan column. And I know it's a little bit silly, right? But, and these E's don't look like E's anymore. But that being said, even if I just showed this to you straight off the bat, you would know that these were letters or some sort of abstract letters. Isn't that fascinating? That we're just so trained to see a pattern. We're just like seeing this pattern and seeing, oh, they're obviously letters even though we've never seen a Y that looks like a little cup. So what if we really break down the letter form system? So this is what I'm trying to do with this lecture tonight. Like what really is at the core of what we love and what we want to breathe and have such a huge passion for? And so if we think about letter forms just as a coded system, just on a really basic level, it's uh, little units of spoken language that we have broken down into 26 letters. So when we are thinking about hello, we think about it and we're writing it down, right? H-E-L-L-O. They are small, like very, very small units of speech. And then we have this uh, rule in society, society that these little glyphs make up these sounds. So when you write this and send this over to someone who is not in that exact spot, this person is looking at those glyphs, decoding them in their heads, and then replaying the sound in their minds. I mean, all subconsciously and really fast, of course, but that is really what's happening. And our alphabet is always evolving. Um, I'm going to focus on the Latin alphabet, although there's so many different script systems in the world, only because this is what I'm familiar with and what you are all familiar with. But just keep in mind that this uh, way of thinking can extend to all these visual systems that you know. So we can see that over time, we have gone through so many iterations of our alphabet. And if we think about technology as the pure definition, as the science of craft, maybe we can think about how we can evolve these letter forms if we wish to. I think we often get stuck in this mindset that like A through Z is something that is given to us and it will always be that way, but it won't be. Maybe not next year, maybe not in 10 years, but maybe in centuries and millennia, it will become something different. And the reason why I want to put, uh, put out this slide where it says, letter forms are a form of technology is that maybe that way we can start thinking about how we can advance this. And I was in a machine learning workshop with Gene Kogan, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but he brought up this really good point where he said, ah, technologies for us is probably things that were invented after we were born. And I think that's a really great way of thinking about it, where maybe if we, if we flip that around, everything is a technology. You know, once upon a time there were scrolls and then somebody had this genius idea to cut them up and then, you know, now I don't have to scroll this big giant scroll anymore and the codex was born. So let's think about it that way. And over time, 
we have developed so many different uh, ways of writing our Latin alphabet. These are so many different styles of A's, but you will probably recognize all of them, if not most of them, as being the letter A. And that's because we have, uh, we have established this vocabulary over time. And if you think about that giant system being in your head where you're able to recognize that that is an A, but that is also an A, that's a really interesting and really vast and miraculous way that we know about these letter forms. And I think letter form systems are really interesting in the way that it's different from any other visual art that is a one-off thing. For example, if you are looking at a piece of pottery or a piece of fine art, it is a beautiful object, but it just exists, and it doesn't need to have a function. Versus letter form systems are unique in the fact that they are visual, but it is a system, and it needs to be codified enough that when you are using this, and using this with other people, it has a very specific function. And without this function, letter form systems will not be systems, right? Like they might as just well be a bunch of scribbles on a piece of paper somewhere. And over time, we have developed so many different ways of expressing our language. And I want to point out that there are so many different uh, amazing visual systems in this vast, wide universe. And I'm trying to shed a little bit of light on that today. So we're going to take the really micro view where we're breaking down letter forms, seeing what constitutes uh, all these little components that make up a letter, and then going uh, and zooming back out to the macro view where we're seeing them as texture, right? When we're thinking about letter form systems and type design specifically, we focus on all the little details, including the little serifs and such forth, but then we are also focusing on what it looks like as a page when it's set uh, on pages and pages of paper. And then we'll take a very brief look at how uh, the history of letter forms have become. So like, we'll look at the past, and then we'll try to see where this is going, perhaps. And so type designers in the audience, please bear with me for a brief second. This is a skeletal version of the italic lowercase. So this rectangular uh, bone structure is what constitutes the main DNA of sorts for this A through Z. So if you see here, this end shape is repeated throughout, uh, throughout the alphabet. And this is what constitutes the rhythm of the main alphabet. So here, it's a very uh, simplified O, of course, but you can see that the O shape is also being repeated. And here's an example that we are probably more familiar with. So for the O and N, type designers is uh, one of the very first letters that type designers design is the lowercase o and the lowercase n. This shape is repeated across the entire alphabet. And this is what constitutes the main structure and rhythm of what, uh, what your typeface looks like. So when you're typing out anything on your computer with the font, this is going to be the main structure. And this is what gives a, a typeface system the consistency and the legibility and the readability because you are re as you're reading, you're expecting this rhythm to happen over and over and over again. And that is what makes a typeface look great as opposed to maybe something that uh, is erratic. And if something happens where you're not expecting it to happen, perhaps that's what the difference is between a rhythm and a noise. So this concept of looking at things in a very modular manner while keeping the DNA alive is probably what uh, made the um, the possibility of superfamilies come alive. So here is Lucas de Groot's thesis. And the top two rows are sands, and the middle two rows are mixed between sands and serifs, and the bottom two rows are serifs. But you can see that they are a family. Although the details are slightly different, they're very clearly the same visual family. And that's interesting to note although we might pass over it without thinking about it. And also in the droid family, you can see that the mono with glyphs are spaced a little bit differently, but there are visual clues that give you the sense that they are, in fact, part of everything else. Like that little chip in that R or the shape of that O. They are consistent across the entire family. And this modularity has not always been a stylistic choice. 
So you were probably used to seeing a lot of these. So for the Atari typeface, you can see that they, they were, it was really low resolution. So they were forced to create a typeface that was modular and had a system based on those little pixel grids. And then a stencil typeface, by contrast, is a method that they needed to, so they could have a stencil um, on a physical surface, being able to spray paint or paint over it to make that um, graphic and then take it off right away. And then we've all seen these digital faces. This is a microwave, but we, all, we are so familiar with this. And also, um, a little bit different of an example, but the Gutenberg Bible, which is the first printed uh, piece uh, of uh, doc, sorry, book uh, in Europe, the molds needed to be more modular to, for them to be efficient in printing this. So that's one of the theories for why they chose textura, because it was so uh, modular, and they could repeat the molds um, so they could be more efficient in making the punches. So here is Paul Renner's drawings for Futura. Futura is well known for the Bauhaus movement and how it affected typefaces. So here he is using the principles of circles, squares, and triangles in order to make a typeface. And we know that later on, he didn't ad adapt all of this into the final drawing. But it's good to see that the modularity idea is still carrying forth. And here is a Joseph Alvarez typeface. I believe it was digitized by P22, but it wasn't made into an actual typeface at the time. But this is the same idea, where the circles, triangles, and squares are making up the DNA of the typeface. And here's Fregio Meccano, made in Italy, where these little parts on the left-hand side were all you needed to create your own DIY typeface. You could stretch it as much as you want. You could do all these things with it. So you, you, can, you can see little numbers, right? It's like a little build-your-own-adventure type of Lego system. And then as technology progresses, people are creating new ways to make this modularity come alive. And the Julian typeface by Peter Bullock, he, create, he created this typeface where everything was based on round squares or a little bit of mix. But then with open type features, there were all these different glyphs that were getting swapped out as you were typing it, contextual alternates for people that know the open, um, the open type lingo. And the Thomas Igmeyer exhibit that's right across the hallway, which is amazing, by the way, and you should definitely go. You can see that Thomas Igmeyer is using that, that power of modularity, so to say. Here you can see the tears of hate arcane. And the, the, that E is not like your usual E. And that A is definitely not like your usual A. But you know that. Like you, didn't, you probably didn't need to think twice about that. But you know that. Isn't that amazing? I'm always surprised by how sensitive our letter, uh, our letter form thinking eyes are. And here's a Victor Moscoso poster. So at first glance, it just looks like a very beautiful graphic piece. But then if you look closely, so the right hand side is I've zoomed it into the little um, the letter form portion. It says October 2nd, poster show. And if you, if you can see, it says North Park. And the fact that you can even see that, and maybe once I point it out, it seems really, ah, of course. It seems logical to you. Like That just proves how sensitive our eyes are to seeing this system that we are trained to see. We're trained to see this pattern. And I was looking at Denise Locke's book on calligraphy, which is an amazing book on uh, her work. I was looking at this page where she was demonstrating different textures. It was light, and then it goes to bold. And I couldn't help but notice that at a certain point, with uh, a little bit of sacrifice on the point of legibility, of course, it just becomes a very beautiful texture, where it loses a little bit of legibility, perhaps, but it gains a lot in the character of it. And so what about things that aren't even letters? This is a page from Armin Hoffman's book where this is an exercise that he gave to his design students where these are dots that are connected based on a leaf. But they look like letters, which I find fascinating. This could be a K. That could be a Y. And so maybe a 
new way to look at letter forms or just observing all these patterns in nature or everything that is around us and thinking that maybe they could be a system that we could use. And there is a lot of parallels between weaving and coding if you uh, are in that digital world. But I also draw a lot of parallels between typeface design and textiles. So here you can see that these squiggles aren't letters, but they feel like they might be, just in a script that we don't know. And in some sketches for, uh, from Annie Albers that she, did, she was doing for textiles, or maybe was an exploration for doing textiles, she makes these things that are almost typewriter art-esque. And it's fascinating. And so if you can think of letter forms as a visual system that has a pattern that we can recognize, and we abandon that idea that A's look like A's and B's look like B's, then perhaps it's not such a crazy idea to think that this could be a letter form system, right? I mean, they are patterns that were woven, but it's conceivable. Let's stretch that line of thinking a little bit. And in Denise Locke's book, she also talks about this uh, inspiration that she draws from everyday material. And so here you can see these textural calligraphy pieces that are clearly drawing inspiration from everyday material that she is seeing. But they retain their identity as letter forms precisely because of that rhythm that she is constructing. And even a stack of firewood could definitely become letter form inspirations. So we've been talking a lot about modularity and getting really into the nitty gritties. So let's talk about history a little bit. So, long time ago, before there was true writing, there was proto-writing. What that means was that the translation process between someone writing something down and then someone decoding it later on wasn't one-to-one. -one. So this is an ancient form of writing, but the texture in itself is really beautiful. And then later on, there is cuneiform, which we often study about when we're studying graphic design history and how it was one of the first systems of writing. And then we think about all the different script systems that existed but are no longer. So this is the famous Rosetta Stone, which was one of the clues for deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphics. So this was a stone that had Egyptian hieroglyphics and then Egyptian dem dem demotic, demotic script and then Greek. Ancient scripts, of course, but this was a clue towards deciphering uh, what the hieroglyphics meant, because it was the same message, just written in different scripts. And our own alphabet is said to have originated from the Egyptian hieratic script. So if you can imagine people doing these pictograms to start with, and then as documents become more and more commonplace and you need to record things that are more transactional in nature, you can't really sit there and draw 40 sheep on a piece of paper, you also need to start writing a little bit faster, and maybe you write a little bit faster, and then a little bit faster, and then it becomes more abstract. And that is where our, our alphabet starts. And of course, the Egyptians take it to the Phoenicians, and the Phoenicians take it to the Greeks, and the Romans just copied everything that, that the Greeks did, right? So <laughs> there we go. So we're back to this slide, the Trajan column. And if we think about what our system looks like, we go to buildings, and we see inscriptions, and they look pretty much the same from the script that is there when we're reading our books. But that wasn't the same back in the day. Like, the Romans had inscriptional writing like this, but then they also had this cursive version of writing where they would use for more everyday documents. And this is written with the reed pen on papyrus. The writing experience seems to be a little bit similar to like a felt tip pen for us where like the reed pen was frayed a little bit at the edges and you could go in whichever direction you could go. And I know that we can't read Roman cursive, but the modularity and the rhythm in here can probably allow us to imagine that if we could read this, it is a very beautiful system. It's so expressive. And this is where I bring out the slide from Hildegard Korger's book where there's all these different scripts that existed before we came along. And this is fascinating. 
And I know that it, it's, maybe it's hard to imagine that a town a little bit over using something that was so different from the way that we were writing our books that you couldn't read it, but that's, how, that's what it was like back in that day. People didn't move for generations. And so like every town had this different way of writing and then the further the regions fell apart, maybe perhaps there was a mountain, a range of mountains in the middle, it would look, might look completely different. And so just a brief mention is Carolingian, which is worth mentioning because this is the backbone of our modern day alphabet, so to speak. So the Holy Emperor Charlemagne said, ah, to improve literacy and to um, help my people, we should have a unified script. So he commissioned Carolingian, which is this beautiful script. And then later on, many, many years later, um, the, the humanists came along. The, the early Renaissance creatives came along and they're like, we were going to revive everything from ancient Roman times. And they made a mistake. They thought this was from the ancient Romans, which was not true. But it was so classic that they thought, this must be true, this must be from the Romans. So they took this and then made it into this form, which we are now using until today. So it, with a little bit of imagination, if we think that perhaps if the Renaissance creatives had actually seen Roman cursive, what would our current day alphabet look like? Ah, a world that never happened, parallel universe, right? So, okay, let's look beyond our preconceived notion of letters. Like so far we've been talking about letters in the vaguest sense, but maybe let's go beyond letters. So, I am skipping a lot of non-Latin alphabets here, but that's a whole another lecture which you will have the privilege of listening to at the Letterform Archive in uh, the coming weeks. So, there's Morse code. With dots and dashes, or sounds, you could express the Latin alphabet. It's a different way. It's not visual, or it could be visual, but it's not. So what if it's tactile? So Braille is tactile. And then Braille has other non-Latin forms as well. So this universe keeps on expanding. And then there's stenography, or shorthand. And there's many, many different ways of writing shorthand. But the, uh, well, to explain a little bit about shorthand, it was a way of writing transcripts. Because there's no way that you could write, as, write a regular script as fast as someone was talking. So people invented the shorthand so they could record as fast as someone was talking. And this is a system that was around even since the, uh, ancient times where I think uh, Cicero speeches were recorded in stenography as well. In, ancient, in an ancient China, they used to record pr uh, prisoner confessions with stenography. And of course, there's many, many different ways that stenography has uh, evolved. And if you see the Japanese shorthand, can you imagine how much faster that would be? Yeah. And of course, all these different scripts as well. And it's not limited to just perhaps the purely functional parts. I was very excited when I came across this. It's colors. I, maybe perhaps not the most efficient way of expressing <laughs> a communication method, but what if you could say something and, would, and you could paint it in beautiful colors? It's funny to think about. And and this, this was really inspiring to me. Be, also because it's so new. People are still doing this all the time. It's not like just something that uh, people from long ago made. People today, just like you, are sitting there and be like, ah, oh, what could I do? How else could I express language? And I think that's very valuable to think about. And this was a very fascinating attempt. So here is the Dotsies font. And the, the instruction on the site goes, dotsies.org, it's fascinating. Uh, so hi there, if you can read this, you can probably read this. And so the description goes on the website, 
like our current Latin alphabet takes up too much space on a screen, right? You have to like scroll too far on your phone. So if you can read these dots, then we'll have so much more screen space. Is it solving a problem? I mean, we don't know. Maybe in like maybe in like a century, we'll be like we'll all be reading like this, and we're like, yeah, I remember like the olden times and people used to have letters that were really wide. With the invention of technology, the way that we express letter forms are always changing, right? So we had printed books, and then we had, you know, we evolved all the way to the, the digital world per se. And like we used to have metal type, but now they come in the form of zeros and ones on our computers. And now what, that, now what does that mean? I know it, it seems like every day someone has to ask a type designer like the classic question of like, do you think we need more fonts? You know, everybody gets that question. Um, and we're always forever trying to be like, oh, well, you know, people are making new music every day. <laughs> like, but I, I think the real answer is that we're inventing new technology all the time. And if, that maybe is the core of why we need you know, new typefaces or new fonts or what have you, because the way we consume communication is always changing. And so we think about Beowulf. This is the MoMA collection now. But the way that this was conceived was that every time fonts were getting printed, it, it's just a series of points that are getting sent to the printer. So if it's just a series of numbers, then why couldn't we randomize it? And so Beowulf is a typeface that is different every time you print it. And I was, I forgot, I think I was on this like blog once and someone said this was the typeface that would get you banned from printers. <laughs> and you can see why. And so nowadays we have new tools. So parametric fonts are fascinating. I find this really fascinating. So if you go on Prototypo, this is a quick video that I took. You can. You can, you can choose all these like sliders and you can customize your own font and ex export it. It's DIY culture that's really interesting. And of course, there's the whole variable fonts that will allow you to do this that are, that's, it's going to be the new frontier of um, retail type. But just as a concept, there are all these different things that are popping up and who knows what is going to be mainstream for us in a little bit. Nobody knows. And this is where it seems like things are getting random a little bit, but I promise it is going somewhere. <laughs> so machine learning is another new thing. It seems like the buzzword nowadays, along with North Star and you know, all those buzzwords. So you, if you feed the computer a lot of data and train it, what can it do? And this is a very interesting thing because fonts are data, right? So if you have, so, if you have a ton of data points, then what could a machine do? And these are just slides from a Gene Kogan workshop that I took because you know I'm, I'm a person that's just like I just need to figure everything out and I just didn't know anything. But like, let me go take a machine learning workshop. And so, see, if you thought you could only interpolate letters, you could also interpolate dogs. <laughs> uh, so there's all these different data points that the computer has of different black dogs. And then so once you feed in the parameters, it will generate completely new dogs. Like these are dogs that have never existed, never will exist, just completely fake dogs, right? And like this is a hamburger that doesn't exist, never have existed. Um, and so is this school bus, which is not quite a school bus, but we recognize as a school bus. And I think this is really interesting because what does this mean for type designers, right? Like, of course, like, a, you know, a school bus is dimensional and it has like wheels and certain colors, but a, a typeface, I think, has less parameters than what a school bus might have. So here is, some, here is someone that took another Again, and uh, yeah, and fed it into this data set of fonts. And so just like the, the dog that was interpolating, this is just a bunch of auto-generated typefaces based on these parameters that this person is feeding. You know, 50K fonts data set. Now, this is getting generated. This is the computer dreaming. I know this is really technical, but uh, I, spent a, I spent a full day trying to wrap my head around these things, and I'm still wrapping my head around these things, so please um, go check these people out uh, if you are interested after this lecture. But it's really fascinating. And at Monotype, uh, this Typo Labs talk from 2017, I highly recommend that you listen to it, because he talks about 
how machine learning could be applied to exploring this vast, vast, vast world of fonts. And so if we can take all these data points and then try, try to make sense out of them, what could we do? So Samplus in particular is tasked at Monotype with the library navigation out of one of the many things that he does. And so here, he, he was trying to classify, like, could you say, I want to find a compassionate font? And could you do that? And so that's something, like, going through, like, 130,000 fonts and labeling them is not something that we can do as people. And we probably don't know all the fonts that ever exist, and nobody will ever be able to tell you all the fonts that ever exist, but a machine will. And maybe this is where our type nerdness can meet the digital world and make our lives a lot easier. And of course, he uses this technology for the new uh, What the Fonts app, where he takes this data set and like, is training the computer so it can identify the difference between all these different scripts, and this is a really crazy problem because if somebody had asked me how, like, what, what typeface that was, I would be like, well, it's some scripty typeface and there's a lot of them. And I could, you know, I wouldn't be able to do that. But this can. And here's a video from the Adobe Max 2018. Oh, I'll just show it to you. It just blew my mind. So here, they're showing off where they're applying a vector effect to a typeset. That's amazing. It's okay, there's another one too, <laughs> which this blew my mind. So everything is an outline. It's like so detailed. There's all these vector points. You can't, there's no way you could recreate this really fast. Like it says generate glyphs. <laughs> Are we all afraid for our jobs now? <laughs> yeah, so this is fascinating. So with machine learning, deep learning, all these different learning algorithms, AI, um, everything is included in the vast world of AIs. We're just left thinking that what just happened there was that it took some data points and the computer knew enough about what A's look like, what B's look like, and so forth enough to make a live text version of this for, for you to just start typing it. And so this leaves me wondering if there is a world somewhere where as a type designer, I just create a word, a test word, and I just like put it in somewhere, and someone, or not someone, something, just generates the full set for me. I mean, it's a little scary, but it can also be liberating. If you're a type designer, if you ever had to like agonize over all those mathematical symbols <laughs> that you're questioning if anyone will ever use, maybe that's not such a bad thing. <laughs> um, and of course, this is an ex these are some experiments that I was doing at this program called the School for Poetic Computation. I was trying to imagine what different axes there could be where currently we have a weight axis uh, and so forth, where these conventional axes are constrained by the program that we have. But what if we could extend these axes? So like I was trying to have a dimensional axis. So this is Helvetica with some programming parameters where I was trying to make it dimensional. And this is interesting to think about. So with the possibilities, of all these different programming languages that you could use, is there a way to think about type differently? And it's not a matter of just hypothesizing, but with this, all this new technology, I just can't help but feel that something new is coming. Something new is always coming, but how do you wrap your head around it even? Yeah, so this is, that was a, an experiment where I was trying to make a little galaxy of sorts, and here is a little helicopter world almost, like trying to make outlines fuzzy and so forth. And then what if you added a time axis? So that's Helvetica going around and around, and then uh, as these threads stay a little bit longer, they get morphed into shorter threads. So they are getting mashed into this blobby shape. 
But it's interesting to think about, because currently there's no way of expressing time with our .otfs. But maybe in the future there will be. And maybe that's something that we can think about. I'm just like throwing out a bunch of questions. So what happens in that world where computers can dream, right? Maybe that's a little scary. Maybe that's a lot of fun. Who knows? I try to think of, as a silver lining, I think about this in history, where there used to be this time where monks were laboring in scriptoriums, like bended over, like writing pages and pages and pages. And all of a sudden, the invention of printing came along, right? And it was crazy. But all the scribes were probably like, oh, I'm going to lose my job. We're all going to lose our jobs. We're all going to be jobless. But if you really think about it, like making a, making a manuscript was so labor intensive. Like, it, first of all, it was not cruelty free, right? Like, like an animal had to die and it was stretched. And that took like maybe like a month. And then like someone had to come along, labor over. Probably, you know, ergonomics weren't a thing. And then somebody came, <laughs> and then somebody came and like illuminated this beautiful object and it got bound to, into a book, which probably only a few pe people ever saw. I can only imagine that um, it was a very, very labor intensive process. And I know that with the arrival of printing, literally ex literacy exploded, like the first universities had all these printed books. and like knowledge was spreading and the world was so much better and that's why we're all here with digital technologies and so forth. And this is the thing, because books became a new form of technology that was widespread, scribes change their career. They're like, okay, well now a lot of people are literate. Let us change our jobs to being teachers instead. And then the writing masters emerge, where they are now freed from doing this only uh, legible work where they are maybe having a little bit more time to be expressive and this is why uh, such beautiful manuscripts uh, exist and writing manuals exist where they are free and this is like a different era right where I have to show off everything that I can do to get more students and to advertise and this is a different and it goes into a different era but that being said if we just take that little nugget of information of Maybe this new technology being on our doorstep isn't such a bad thing. Maybe it'll free us to do crazier things. And then if we think about this, maybe with the you know, arrival of all this new technology available to us, maybe like we'll just be making 10 different fonts a day instead of making one a year. Who knows? And so this lecture has all been to say, that I love connecting dots. I think about the constellations from long ago where I just look up at the sky and I'm like, huh, there's shiny things up there. And then some people thought, oh, OK, well, there's a, there's a bear and there is a snake. And then I was like, huh, I wouldn't have thought that. And so this is a way to, for me to perhaps say to you, that maybe we should look at all these things, the patterns in nature, little parts and serifs, like machine learning, AI, who knows what's going to be out there tomorrow, and to try to connect these little dots in order to see what we can do with them.